The ultimate internet troll hits Amazon Prime, the great McDonald's in the sky has one new patron, and Guillermo del Toro doesn't mince words with Alfonso Cuaron. Oh, it's time for class. Class is in session! Roll call! Bueller. I'm gonna be late for class. Bueller. Am I hallucinating here? Just what in the hell do you think you're doing? Late for class. You are mine now. You belong to me. Did you study for the test? No more complaining. No more Mr. Kimblet to go to the bathroom. Nothing. There is no bathroom. <laughs> Hello, classmates. Welcome to another episode of Middle Class Film Class. I'm your host for today, Pete. I'm Tyler. And I'm Joseph. And we have a banner show today. Fantastic show. And welcome to everybody in YouTube Live and otherwise. And of course, the OG classmates in podcast land. Thank you so much for joining in, listening, downloading week after week. We, it means a lot. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, here we are. Oh, we're here. We're here. Yeah. We, and you, you guys have jackets. I have jackets. It's uh, cloudy today, so I, I, I'm well, a jacket. I, I, I wouldn't call this a, it's a, it's a flannel, not a jacket. It's a long sleeve. And this isn't very thick. This is just like a little... A long sleeve. No, it's not a long sleeve. I just said it's a flannel. Look at the flannel How patterning much, on it. Would me. you consider those sleeves short? <laughs> Technically, flannel's a fabric, not a an apparel. It's been colloquialized oh. into an Oh, is that a, right? A, like oh, I, had, I had no idea. Oh, like khakis. Okay. khakis yeah. Or sharpies. Are, khakis actually a color. Okay. They're khaki pants, khaki yeah. slacks. All right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, now that we've got Apparel past the, talk. the important That's stuff, new. I know. We <laughs> moved on from weather talk to uh, pants talk. No, <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about the weather. Oh, no, we're not talking no, about no, the weather. No, I gave you the old switcheroo. God damn it. I was thinking, <laughs> I had a little random thought on the way over about our our personalities and the show and mm-hmm. like how it's evolved over the last four years yeah mm-hmm. right? sure. almost five yeah and how we have our own sort of unconscious subconscious conscious bits that we personality oh, yeah. traits that mm-hmm. we bring to the show mm-hmm. okay tyler's is terrible bits and bad, <laughs> bad opinions <laughs> Sorry. Like, I, I don't know what to say <laughs> wait a minute like that, that's, Hold his, on. that's his bit i don't need i don't need this attack my, from my you. bit my bit is that i don't want to be here and <laughs> and pete's is like he doesn't take anything seriously Wait a I take the show seriously. Where's, where's, where's but this that's the bit. Is this, a, this assault. Yeah, it's it's all in good nature. We're all aware Six that we do years. this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a, it was just a thought that I had on the way over. That's funny. I'm trying to think if I that's actually funny. have any other bits. I don't. I don't. Disparaging I don't, Tyler all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't know why I'm being assaulted uh, by you. Joseph. I mean, take your, take who's, your who's being assaulted. Take your medicine. Well, That's your I, I, I've always been a assault- I've always been taking my medicine and being a also s- playing the victim. That's Tyler's bit. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. Here we go. Here we go. Outrageous, Tyler. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm very outrageous. <laughs> yeah. um, so, anyways, we have um, we actually have a really really exciting first segment on the show. Mm. We have a, a, a guest who's a, a director and partially a victim partially a victim yeah so <laughs> we're gonna get into that here in a, in a just a second for some gavin chatter find some charity you lad now's the time for gavin chatter gavin chatter movie news of the week and normally i would default to tyler we go in the rotation but i'm going to take the point on this one because on the back line we have a i already kind of mentioned it already peter john ross who is the director of of a new documentary called Social Media Monster that is out on Amazon Prime next week, available for rental. And we have him on the back line now. What's up, Ross? How you doing, buddy? Hello. How's everybody doing? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Doing, doing great. Well. Good to have you here. Fantastic. We got our long sleeves on, except for Pete. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm nice and cool. Yeah, so where are you calling us from? I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, okay. So you're not, you're not in M- Missouri, where the events no. of your documentary take place. No, I, I was blissfully uninvolved until I got a phone call from a city councilman in Missouri. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> councilman. Yeah. So, yeah, oh. the, basic, the basic idea of it is I had this encounter on an indie film site in 2012. This guy originally called himself Taylor Hanachek. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, we had a disagreement on a website. No big deal. Mm-hmm. Then a few days later, I started getting emails from a Matt Allen or Matthew Kane, depending on which email address he used, referring to that stuff. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait, are you the guy from that other site? And I just told him, yeah, I have no interest in whatever you're talking about. And then he just hammered me. Mm-hmm. Oh, geez. Like, and like dozens of threatening emails saying that he was... Uh, He's like, I just filed a lawsuit. It was like a Sunday morning. And he's like, a process server's on his way. And I'm like, 
Okay, you know, by the way, 14 years later, that process server never arrived. I certainly hope they're okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the basically the long and short of it, so, so the documentary is called Social Media Monster. And I think at, at first, when I first, when you contacted me and, and kind of gave me the, the, the scoop on your, on your doc, I was thinking it was about the overall concept of social media in our society. And I, I've kind of shared and talked with some people about this since I watched it, because it is fascinating. It's a r- real worthwhile watch. And everyone said, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame what you know, social media is doing to, to society. And that's kind of what I went into. Instead of that, it's a very pointed view of one specific troll online that almost it almost supersedes and transcends like the title of a social media troll in my opinion and matthew burdick is the guy's name and uh he's he terrorized you he terrorized this small town what's the name of the town in missouri again and now we're the next saint victim. joseph saint joseph that's it yeah so it's the town of saint joseph who he not even from you're just passing through one day and decided to make this place his home and one small altercation at a denny's turned into <laughs> I hop. Oh, I hop. Yeah, I hop. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I apo- formally apologize to uh, I hop LLC. But the this altercation turned into this quote unquote uncovering the truth and of corruption in St. Joseph, Missouri. And you're like, it's the small town outside of yeah. St. Louis that is a birthplace of Eminem or something like that. Or I can't remember the. Come yeah, Eminem was born there. Uh, you also had Jesse James was shot and killed there. Oh yeah, that was it. Really interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, but it's a fascinating yeah. story that, and you got pulled into this from completely out of state. And yeah. Name besmirched. You had a, a television series of uh, frame lines that was basically canceled as an indirect result of this, and it's yep. ins- completely insane. What compelled you to make this into the doc? I mean, I know I know why because I watched the doc, but what compelled you to make it? <laughs> Well, I, the weirdness is, is like I said, it's. I wish this Matthew Burdick was not nearly as compelling and interesting of a character, <laughs> because and it's for all the reasons he doesn't think they are. Mm-hmm. It's like it's just you. It's like watching a train wreck in extreme slow motion, and you cannot take your eyes off of it. And I wish that wasn't true. I wish I was not obsessed with. How does this end? How does someone live like this? It just Mm -hmm. fascinates me endlessly. Yeah, it it is. It is fascinating. So basically, yeah, there was that incident at the IHOP, (laughs) and it just spiraled out of that from there because he just, I don't know what compels him or motivates him truly, but he wanted to make a national incident out of it, attempted to get local media, local TV, Mm, mm. Uh, the police, the city council, get them all riled up about what he calls like quote unquote hate crime. Mm-hmm. But no one on the planet agrees with them that a hate crime occurred. Yeah. Cause it didn't, it's like factually, that's not what happened. Yeah. But he's railing against reality and, but that's all of a sudden corruption. And the worst part about this is, is this is a 90 minute documentary about just what happened in St. Joseph. The virtually identical story has happened in Des Moines, Iowa, wow. Hinkley, California, Akron, Ohio, Front Ooh. Royal, Virginia, Asheville, North Carolina. All from this one it's, guy, huh? It's, he, it's like Groundhog's Day. He keeps reliving <laughs> the same incident, just in a different town. And it's bizarre because... Again, the question comes up is, is he actually not recognizing reality as in, is he delusional and mentally ill, or is it actually very much a conscious act on his part to get attention, to Hmm. just Hmm. be a pest and bother people? I mean, like you could go both ways on it. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, you could, you could, (laughs) you could argue that getting attention in that nature could be a mental illness as well. Yeah, it's like attention seeking sort of yeah. compulsion or whatever. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it's like a compulsion for him to be the center of attention. Yeah. Well, and but that's the other thing is when you say mentally ill, mild depression is a mental illness. Mm-hmm. Full blown non functioning schizophrenia is a mental illness. It's a pretty broad spectrum. Yeah. Sure. So we have this overcompensation today to when you hear mental illness, 
you want to give empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I definitely want to give empathy to Matthew Burdick, but if you do anything that does that shows that everything he will take advantage of it and yeah. run with that ball he makes it very it, difficult to i guess <laughs> feel sorry for him and, and i mean the, i guess that's just the complicated nature of human of, of humans really it yes. is and just for context joseph and i watched the documentary sorry to call you out tyler tyler has not seen it yet no. but it is you have to watch this tyler to get a full view of what type of person you're dealing with because as the documentary evolves you're kind of like and these talent people are kind of they're making a big deal. Like they're making a whole documentary about this guy. It's not that bad. And then it spirals yeah. into a point where there's uh, terrorist threats against a nuclear facility. Oh my God. Over somebody <laughs> questioning whether or not he's like famous or something. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Very minor slights against this person's character turns into essentially what could be a national security risk. Mm. And it's, you know, that, that line, the towing the line, like I do feel sorry for him and I do hope he gets help. But the reality is he's living with either an undiagnosed or untreated severe personality disorder. And the people of name the city across the country are the ones that are dealing with the effects. And the crazy thing about the documentary, Ross, as I'm watching it, you guys talk, talk about it a couple times is nobody's doing anything about it. There's no, as far as like no a, one will. an official, you know, official sort of response because there's an actual threat against a nuclear facility, like a, a, a firebombing against a nuclear facility that's portrayed done by this guy. And they have receipts, they have notes, they have emails from him, they have public records that are available, screenshots and whatnot. Yeah. And the basically the FBI has investigated him and nothing happened from it. Hmm. So it's like, what happens one day when he makes good on one of those promises and pays off yeah. on this? I mean, you do, the, you do a good job in the documentary doing the parallels with other actual domestic terrorists like school shooters and like people with that give away the, the have warning signs uh, and then they do the thing because no one had no one stepped in no one and, stepped in. and, and yeah. interfered and, and that's actually the the actual answer when you ask why did i make this documentary is it's not i didn't make a movie about matthew burdick i made a movie about these bigger issues mm -hmm. yeah this bigger story about how where we're at as a society right now that is we're at a very strange crossroads. We have law enforcement is stuck with the laws we have, mm -hmm. which are very much 20th century laws. And then you have the courts that as I've been experiencing, because what's happened since the documentary is he made so many violent threats. I had to get a civil stalking protection order, which is now granted. Mm. He's violated it numerous times. Mm. There are warrants for Matthew Burdick's arrest in Columbus, Ohio. But guess what? Misdemeanors, which means if he never sets foot in Franklin County, Ohio, mm -hmm. nothing will happen to him. Yeah. I am working on a kind of, for lack of a better word, <laughs> sequel that's the broader, <laughs> bigger story. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting thing for that is I have audio recordings with FBI agents, chiefs of police, where they flat out say he is permitted, that's the word they use, permitted to continue doing this as long as he stays out of Franklin County. Wow. So it's there's very a, so strange to have unrelated law enforcement <laughs> use the same word, mm -hmm. permitted. It's also strange, like the apathetic nature of it all. It, it you it, would think you would think like all of these threats mm -hmm. and crimes against society would garnish some sort of maybe punishment. We should, we should, maybe we should check this guy out. Yeah, <laughs> or at the very least, you know, as I'm watching this, you know, another person get their physical, you know, like there's a, at one point in the documentary, there's a, like a benefit show that these people who have been kind of harassed by this guy decide to put on. And there's like a local band from St. Jo uh, Joseph that are kind of a, they might be giants type of, you know, modern mm. band. And they make these fun lyrics using his threatening messages. <laughs> Hilar One of my favorite parts of the documentary is when they're playing that song and the lyrics are popping up on screen and it's actual screenshots of his text messages and Facebook comment threads and stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the most ridiculous things with terrible grammar. But when he when, when they're when they're promoting the when they're promoting this this it's the victims of Matthew Burdick fund. Mm -hmm. They he's physically saying, if someone dies tonight, it's not my fault. Watch, watch your back on stage. There might be an assault rifle in the audience. 
like things like that. And you're like, that's how much more of a direct then, correlation do you have to have? You know? Oh right yeah. Now. And just so you know, the FBI were undercover at the concert. Yes. They stuck out like a sore thumb. You could tell they were there. Oh, okay. So and I say this in the documentary is like, so they found his threats credible enough to be there, mm -hmm. but not credible enough to do a damn thing about it. So yeah. if he did show up, they might get shot as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think Fuck. he would have never made it through the door. No. And and that's the, the other thing too, is like all of the threats and all of the, besides the, you know, kind of getting involved with people's personal lives, you know, calling someone's work and saying, you know, this person's working for you and they're a pedophile, by the way, with no substantiation or whatever it might be that he's threatening, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the, the real world repercussions of that, you know, meddling, it seems like all these are threats are idle. They're blind. Mm -hmm. They're just like, right. they're, they're glib. He, make, he says, I'm going to sue you, and then the lawsuit never happens 12 years later. You yeah. know? Maybe the, I just had this conspiracy theory about Burdick okay. himself. Maybe he's the, they won't do anything because he's like a sleeper agent. Oh, shit. He's, like, he's a disruptor? He's like a government experiment gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's Dan Stevens in The Guest. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I don't know. I mean, I, I hate to give him that much credit. I just hope he gets help yeah, <laughs> more right. than anything. I, I, I Funny thing is, is... Sadly, one other person has suggested that exact thing to me oh, that really? was my ex-girlfriend. I'm like, so you think it's more likely <laughs> the government was involved and is allowing this as opposed to just untreated mental illness? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's probably less likely, but it is fun to think about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, there, I'm not going to say there's no possibility, yeah. but the possibility is so remote. And given the number of of FBI agents I've spoken with mm -hmm. about Matthew Burdick. The last time I spoke to an agent, which was at this point, eight, nine months ago, mm -hmm. 16 FBI offices have an open file with his name on it. Bro, mm. bro, they have less than the Unabomber. 16. <laughs> what are we gonna do about FBI this Burdick guy? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, that's someone well, else's no, problem. <laughs> when they were, the, the agents from Cleveland told me that when they were when they got the file they said well the agents are kind of in the different areas are kind of split half think he's all talk and it's beneath the fbi to even look at him mm -hmm. the other half were like i don't want to be the one to have to answer if he's actually serious and something happens so i want to take it so the nuclear threat the cleveland office got to take lead for a while mm -hmm. and according to them they told me this directly they presented it to the United States attorney. They do four or five months of investigation mm -hmm. and they have under two minutes to pitch it to the United States attorney. Jesus. Oh, man. And the United States attorney said, if I get one 80 year old woman on the jury that doesn't understand how the internet works, this is not a slam dunk <laughs> next. Oh man. That's a bummer. And then the other offices of the FBI, like I think San Francisco, mm -hmm. Are, I mean, this is pure speculation on my part. No one told me which office, but when I spoke to this one agent in San Francisco named Roland Martinez, I'm going to say his name because I think he quit, but also fuck him. Sorry for the language. <laughs> All right, yeah. Fuck him because I remember talking to him about, hey, he's making the mother of his daughter, Burdick's daughter, extremely nervous about threatening to show up there. Can you at least call her and make her feel better? He never called. Yeah. What a piece of shit that mm -hmm. FBI agent was that no empathy whatsoever for someone that was scared to death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow. Yeah. And it's all for him was like, I, he's, he's actually said, this is beneath the FBI. That's what he said on the phone to me making ter domestic terrorist like threats that's yeah. beneath the fbi it's the fact that they're even like having this discussion i feel like warrants enough to step in pontiff but, he might be a terrorist or yeah not. <laughs> think about the opposite think about the opposite then you're in the minority report area uh -huh. we also have to think and being a film this is why making the documentary was so therapeutic for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm is I have to play all sides. Mm -hmm. I have to look at things as objectively as I can, and it's kept me very sane. So when I look at that, it's okay, so what's the flip side? He hasn't done anything per se. Except for- That can start to curtail civil rights. Yeah, mm -hmm. threats and disturbing the peace. 
But again, that sounds more like local charges. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah, it doesn't right. sound yeah. like FBI federal charges. Yeah. So do you see what I mean? Is yeah, it's also I get like, it. Yeah. It's a bureaucratic so, uh, conundrum that they're in. It is. It's a thing to where it's no different than getting a murderer off on a technicality. Is it's like, Yeah. But setting you, them free yeah. is at the expense of innocent people not going to jail. That's a good point. That's a good point. But and then you're just in the stalemate of doing nothing. Yes. Yeah. And the, and the people yeah. who are in, in his weird circle mm. are the ones that are essentially the victims, you know? Yeah. It's yep. almost like this state of fear. So I have, I have a question. Somebody in our chat, Bruce, he mentions, I assume this project addresses the idea of feeding the troll, as in this documentary actually kind of feeds that sort of person. And yes. I, and, and I think I think that you, you talk, talk about it in the documentary enough and you mentioned it a little bit, but can you give us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, actually, it, I, 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 it is a little bit in the documentary, but separate from the documentary, yeah, the idea of don't feed the troll, well, there's a couple layers there for me on this. Number one, it's way, way too late for me. This started for me 12 years ago. Jesus. And it's never really stopped. I think his obsession with me mm. is so extreme I, I have gone 12 and 18 months of nothing, no acknowledgement, nothing. He was still filling up my inbox. He was still tweeting about me, mm -hmm. Facebook posts about me. It didn't slow anything down. Yeah. So I have to weigh it out now in terms of giving him what he wants, which is he's going to be able to get fans almost. And I mean, I hope this analogy is, I'm not trying to really compare him to this, but it's like Charles Manson getting love letters. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> it's like yeah. Charles Manson getting love letters. And in his, in Burdick's case, it's like, he's going to get women that feel sorry for him and send him money. Yeah. Yeah. So he can keep moving and keep getting away with this stuff. Right. I have to weigh that versus the victim's stories being unheard and never experiencing justice. Mm -hmm. Right. I have to weigh it against this documentary forewarning people if he starts harassing you the best thing to do is the opposite of what i did <laughs> ignore him you already pot I committed didn't. yeah you already pot committed you can't turn back now because here well i mean again i do not ever want to portray myself as a sweet angel that never did anything wrong <laughs> no, no 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 when i got those emails in 2012 from matt kane and i didn't know his real name at the time mm. I was going through a divorce, even though I'd never gotten married. <laughs> when, oh. <laughs> my girlfriend and I had been together for 10 and a half years. So when you own property and pets together yeah. and lawyers have to be involved in your breakup, mm. I got divorced, but never got married. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, get so, it. I, get um, it. I get it. So what happened was on the day that she took the kitten that I'd been with for 10 years Aww. and we're splitting up our cats, I got two cats. She got her cat back. The night she picked up that cat was like, it was, that was when I got the eighth email in a row from Burdick calling me a fat fuck. Wow. Oh, God. Which to be clear, hey, some guys got a six pack. I got the whole keg. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay with my weight. I'm not offended by it, but it's kind of like, who is this guy? Well, He's just punching you down though. But here's what's great about it is it's, well, somebody's got to pay for my misery. Why not the asshole that just called me a fat fuck at <laughs> yeah. the end of the row? So I went like this. I'm like, well, let's get to that keyboard and work out some frustration. Yeah. And I wrote the most heinous, horrible shit. Like I actually, he had sent me like a nine paragraph autobiography <laughs> that I'd never read oh that night. God. And I went through it paragraph by paragraph and just ripped it to shreds. I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh, you're saying your father abused you? Well, maybe he didn't hit you hard enough because you didn't fucking <laughs> learn anything. Jesus Christ. Uh, so, I mean, I was in a really bad place. Sure. And just so you know, as much as that might be playing for laughs, mm. it was entirely wrong of me sure, yeah. to do that. Mm -hmm. I have apologized to Matthew for this repeatedly, and I'll do it again right now. Mm -hmm. Matthew, I'm sorry that I said these things to you. And the thing is, and again, it doesn't just always oh, just the one time. In 2015, he did the same thing. Oh I started my God, getting. It keeps going. I had, had a year and a half where I forgot he existed. Mm -hmm. Thank God. And I started getting these weird email replies from Reply Alls, and I didn't realize he was in my spam folder. I look at it. He never stopped emailing. <laughs> <laughs> no. And now, in January or February of 2015, after 18 months of silence from me, 
He's sending me and a bunch of people I'd never heard of emails saying, I am demanding that you all leave me alone. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? I, I didn't even remember who you were. So again, I couldn't help myself at the time. Yeah. And I didn't reply all to complete strangers going like, Hey, everybody, I'm looking forward to next month when we have our anti-Matthew Burdick picnic. <laughs> we go to Dream Theater cover band because that's his favorite band. I was like, I got that. I go, and I just listed off the names like Ernest, who I'd never heard of. I'm like, Ernest, you can bring the, the potatoes. And I was like, you, Marjorie, you're going to bring <laughs> the wine, right? You said you're bringing the wine. Mm -hmm. And it just like, and of course, what did that do? That just lit him up like a Christmas tree. Like, I always knew you guys were working together. <laughs> It's like, oh my God. And at one point, the one of the dumbest things I did is my address for my work was a suburb of Columbus called Westerville. And he said, I'm going to let the Westerville police know there's a predator roaming the streets that says these things to people. I'm like, and I just looked up the name of the chief of police. It was like William something. I go, well, you tell Bill I said hello and I'll see him at the poker game. Oh, He'll do yeah. whatever I tell him to do. You know, it's oh, like total good. fantastic. He then emails the chief of police about all this. You know, I knew you were corrupt. <laughs> you need to do something about this. And I was like, oh, can't he do it? I need to bring this back down that way a little too far. Yeah. Oh, oh my I gotta God. By the end of the year, I'd filed for my first civil stocking protection order against him. Mm. That never went through because we couldn't find him to serve him. Mm. Well, I got a couple of things that I, I wanted to touch on before we got to break off. But number one, this really kind of touches on the delicate fabric that is our social norms. You know, like we can speak in, in confidence with each other, like normal people yeah. that, you know, with sarcasm is picked up as sarcasm, especially when it's laid on very, very thick, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and it's, like you're a documentary filmmaker and like a, basically a, what's give us a little bit about frame lines to your TV series. Well, I, my partner Scott Spears and I co-created the show Frame Lines for regional PBS in the entire state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. It was an educational show about filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I'm 100% self-taught, so every time I'd learn something, I would make a little two or three minute tutorial. Mm -hmm. And eventually, uh, Burdick in 2014 started contacting the Ohio Channel, which is like a the, you know how they have with air stations. There's like 13.1.2.3 point yeah, now. Yeah. It was the point two station of every PBS in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And that's what we were on was the Ohio channel. Originally we were on PBS with WOSU. Then we got to the Ohio channel. Well, Burdick started emailing them, telling them to remove it. And in 2017, I think it was, he told them that I was a pedophile and that he would run an advertisement campaign saying they support pedophiles if they continued to show the shows. So they called me and they said, yeah, we don't believe him, but we don't it's wanna, easier for yeah. us to cancel your show than deal with his nonsense. Damn. Yeah. So they canceled the show. Yeah. And I mean, that was a revenue stream and everything for me. Yeah. I mean, I lost money making that. Not a lot. I mean, I basically made $2 an hour with the amount of time and sure. passion I put into that show. Mm -hmm. And but, I've spun off the, educate, the purely educational videos I was doing because mm -hmm. I got as you probably know from the movie, I got four regional Emmy nominations for mm -hmm. frame lines for the educational segments. But my mom epically said that <laughs> she reminded me quite often, a nomination is not a win. <laughs> Thanks mom. Yeah. Um, and, and well, it gets worse is uh, my mom passed away this past January. Yeah. I, um, I saw so them. I saw the uh, dedication. I'm sorry. I'm I dedicated so sorry. it to her in the end credits. But then the worst thing is what does Burdick do? Oh, goes God. on Twitter, does a live rage, shit talks my mom. Uh, does some he's like really, the Westboro Baptist Church, this guy. Yeah. That's, a, he, that's a good analogy. He yeah. said some of the most heinous shit anyone could have ever said. And it's just terrible. This yeah. is terrible. Yeah. That's a bummer, I mean, You man. know what happens? Instead of getting angry, I get the opposite. I get more empathetic. I start wondering, like, what makes this guy hurt in such a way? Yeah, for real. Yeah. That's kind of what that I think makes about me, it. That's how I, I feel about it. When he attacks me like that, it's not anger I get. It's empathy. It's like, why can't this guy get help? Why can't he see that this is saying these horrible things makes him a terrible human being? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No right. question. Mentally he ill or not, attacking a family when our mother died is yeah. not. Yeah. It really does feel like Westboro Baptist Church. I never even thought about it like that, Joseph. But um 
So, so th- that's basically the long and short of it of social media monster. When is it hit? When is it available for people to uh, access on Amazon? Technically, it's supposed to hit May thirty first on Amazon Prime for rental and purchase. Okay, they might be pushing it a week because uh, somebody, for some reason, is contacting them, upset about the content of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I weird. wonder who it was. Yeah, <clears throat> and I wonder which singular person is doing that. But. <laughs> and I will say, I will co opt this. It is a is a really strong recommend. I know that you've you mentioned on some of your like Twitter posts, oh, it's just my little documentary, you know, don't you know, don't <laughs> don't go into a too high expectation. So humble. Yes, yeah, very humble about it. But the the content <laughs> of what you have there is absolute like fascination. Cause yeah, everybody who's has any presence online can have at least some sort of like recognition. Relatability. Yeah, relatability to it. It's like I've known people that just don't stop online. It's like you can't, they will not stop no matter how how much you ignore them. They just keep going. And at some, at some point you're just like, all right, I'm going to block this person and I never have to see him again. And they somehow find a way to contact you. It's like this times a thousand, but then times a thousand people who are being affected by this guy. Yeah. I don't know how well, he physically has the time. Yeah. He's still doing it to this day. And you don't want to know the worst thing about what's happening right now today in May of 2024. What's that? He's in a pilot program with Facebook where they're fucking paying him for engagement on Facebook. Damn. Yeah, that's, that's He's on like his fifth or sixth permanent ban. <laughs> and yet he has an account under his name and they are paying him right now. <clears throat> Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the insane thing is, you know, it doesn't take much to get banned on Twitter or Facebook or any of these things. And you get a 24-hour temp ban or a 48 three-day ban or whatever. At some point, it's like it turns into a permanent ban. And this fucking guy's still there. He's out still doing it. So he brings yeah, in the I numbers. Mean, <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely well, fascinating. And, but here's, and look at the other side of that. The last thing I'll say about this, which is law enforcement is only made to deal with the real world. Mm-hmm. I interviewed two cops that were here about violating the civil style protection order. So I, they had just gotten out of the academy. They, I was like, how long were they there? They're like, Six months of training. I'm like, how much time was spent about internet and internet crimes? He said, 48 minutes. Damn. Yeah, that makes sense. 48 minutes. Jesus. 48 <laughs> minutes. That's it, all the training he got about internet crimes as a cop. Yeah. It's now, again, it's that's not shame. his fault. That's at a much higher pay grade than that poor kid. Yeah, for sure. But then the other thing about that is, is well, who should regulate it? Social media companies. The more people fight online, the bigger the engagement mm-hmm. or eyeballs, the more they can charge for ads. Mm-hmm. So not only are they not inspired to stop it, they it, profit from it. Yeah, they have yeah. a financial stake to l- let it keep going. That's a yeah. damn it's so a damn shame. That's that's where we're at in the world and it sucks. Yeah. Uh, all right, listeners, go, uh, wait until nine, May 31st or maybe a little bit later, bookmark it, go to so- justwash.com and add it to your watch list. The documentary is called Social Media Monster. And uh, Peter John Ross, you go by Ross. Thank you, Ross. I really appreciate you, buddy. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate yeah. it. And watch the damn movie. Yeah, watch the one it. Guy who did. <laughs> <laughs> watch it, damn it. Keep Tyler. An eye out for, Tyler. I will. I will. Keep an eye out yeah, for Tyler. Social Media Monster 2. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, see you, buddy. Thank you. Bye. Oh, boy. What a delight. I feel like we pr- we're putting our lives in danger by <laughs> discussing this documentary. <laughs> Just after that discussion. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, Ross did say he's going to send us a, a list of accounts that we should pre-block uh, on Twitter and Facebook. Just, just to prepare. Yeah, just to get ready for it. And we'll put, <laughs> I'll put all the emails into the all the different email addresses for yeah. the Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please so, do. Please do. Tyler, you barely even have an online presence. What do you have to worry about? What are you talking about? I have a, I have all a, you do is retweet AI from Mangos. I don't t- t- <laughs> retweet. I, I don't retweet. I'm not even on Twitter. Half, half AI of the AI waifus. Half of the Instagram <laughs> stories, stuff that you post to your stories are all AI. I don't know if you know that. Yes, I do know that. I'm, I'm very acutely aware. And of why what are you I'm doing posting. it? Why are you supporting AI art? Because it looks cool. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. This you come on you come on this show and say, Oh yeah, I support I support anti AI for the arts, and then you're out here, it's, uh, look at this waifu, she's hot. I'm gonna repost it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Have some integrity, boy. I did, did, all right, fine. <laughs> Whatever. Stay with convictions. Whatever. Can I go on to my new story? Is is the cartoon boner worth it? The car- <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have an AI boner. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. All right. 
Yeah. So yeah, that was really, really uh, yeah, fascinating. That was, yeah, that was a very illuminating normally uh, conversation. We, normally we don't have guests on that long, but I didn't. I feel like we didn't. Didn't I didn't even want to let that conversation end. Um, I know. I we should have asked him to watch Frangoli. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So Tyler, go ahead and go with your new story. Morgan Spurlock, who was famous for directing the Super Size Me documentary where he ate McDonald's for 30 days. He's passed away from complications from fighting cancer. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, so, so in, it's interesting because Super Size Me is, is a controversial documentary because mm-hmm. at the time that he was making it, he was like a severe alcoholic. And so yeah. like all of the all of the um, symptoms that he was showing that he was portraying as just eating McDonald's all day. Fatty liver disease. It was just him just being uh, being a sauce head. Mm-hmm. And sauce so, head. <laughs> I've never heard that phrase before. And so, I like it. And so that's why that's why a lot of people disparaged the, the documentary because I I think they made it. I think there was someone who made a documentary in like the same vein of Super Super Size Me, where they ate McDonald's for replicated. Yeah, they replicated it and they were fine. Um, Well, that guy's fucking eating Big Macs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every every day. Yeah, that one tall dude. Yeah, and he's still doing it. And he looks he looks pretty uh, gangly too. John Lennon looking ass. Yeah, Yeah. he does look like John Lennon. (laughs) He 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 was he was he was he was he was a sexual fiend. I was telling um, Tyler that we could I could set my watch to how reliable he is about certain things. <laughs> Number one, didn't watch the movie I asked him to watch. Mm-hmm. Number two, um, talk ill of the dead the week they die. <laughs> Roger Corman died and within an hour. Tyler's like, you know, fuck him. Mm-hmm. Marlon Spurlock's been cold for f- less than 48 hours and he's already calling him an asshole. <laughs> no, that's He put a hit piece out of him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Don't cry for this guy. He's no, a prick. <laughs> no, he's, he's been accused uh, of sexual mis- misconduct uh, numerous times. This guy is a piece of shit. But yeah, rest in peace, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the reason why I'm mentioning this story, so this movie came out, in, or this documentary came out in 2004, yeah, and 20 years ago. Right, yeah. <clears throat> I feel like this movie inspired a lot of other documentary filmmakers to go on. And because this movie, th- this movie, or this, do- I'm sorry, I keep saying movie. This documentary, I feel, captured a general audience. And yeah. because before... It was very accessible to the masses. Because before... It's also disgusting to watch. <laughs> yeah, it was it's a little uh, shot in Freud. Yeah, it, sure. was, it was a little disgusting. But before kind of made uh, me want a McNugget though. <laughs> <laughs> but before Super Size Me came out, documentaries were kind of like known as being like this is this is this I don't want to watch this. This is something you would watch like in a classroom. I have to learn in my free time. Yeah. Oh. Very scientific. Yes. But I feel <laughs> But what I feel Spurlock did was inspire general audiences or the general public in general, general public in general, (laughs) the general public to be interested in documentaries Mm -hmm. and documentaries after Super Size Me. We have Fahrenheit 9-11 coming out. That was Uh, after Super Size Me? I think it was before, but at least are you saying to go seek those out? Right. Yeah. It became it became in the zeitgeist of movies to watch. Mainstream documentaries. Yeah, mainstream documentaries. And so, you know, yeah, it's it you know, it sucks that he died, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> this is a I don't know this. This man. is a, a touching eulogy you're I giving out. I don't know. <laughs> you know, fun fact, there was one time when I was in Vegas, like in twenty fifteen, and I was walking to the hotel casino floor mm-hmm. and Spurlock was there. And he was filming for a, he was filming a show or something, huh. and I I walked by him. I was like, "That's fucking super size me guy over there." Mm. And <laughs> really, I remember him being kind of tall. Like, oh, he, oh. He, I mean, at least at the time, he looked like he was like over six foot. Oh, you know, oh. I don't yeah. know. I would just I, that, you, that was like the closest interaction that I ever had with him. I interesting. Just, I saw him filming at a at a at a table. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Spurlock. Uh, he's he's cold and dead in the ground. 
and from he and yeah from well does it say what kind of cancer no it doesn't say general cancer. Just, yeah just, general I, cancer yeah you know just general cancer <laughs> he had bonitis i think yeah maybe so and also i'm, I'm springing this discussion on you Please guys don't. we were we had yes, a 30 I minute, no, no, 30 no, minute no, initial know. segment i'm springing this discussion on you i want to know so i was at the bar uh, a couple <laughs> nights ago big surprise Actually, you know what <laughs> big <laughs> surprise i was at the bar a couple nights ago okay and uh, i heard that this this <laughs> 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 I heard this discussion. <laughs> God damn it. I heard this discussion about what was inside the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, Marcellus Wallace's briefcase. Well, and, okay. you, and you know, like when Vincent, he opens up the briefcase and then it shines, the orange, it shines yeah. with the orange light. Yeah. So, for a little bit of context, when the in lore of our human society, when the devil takes your soul out of your body, they go from the back of the head, which is why he had the Band-Aid on the back of his head, Marcellus Wallace. Okay. And so everyone theorized, oh, well, it was the soul of Marcellus Wallace in the briefcase. Everyone theorized that? Yes. Everyone? Yes. Everyone. Did they? Matthew Burdick theorized that. Oh. <laughs> I don't think we should mention his name. It's like Beetlejuice. <laughs> I think, them. Take the shit. <laughs> so anyway, so I was at the bar and I heard I heard these bros talking about about that. <laughs> okay. And they were like, "Oh, I think it was a soul. No, I think it was like a diamond or something, something crazy, like something supernatural or whatever." A diamond. And <laughs> I, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you. I said the. I said the most. Oh God! You shot across the bar. <laughs> no, I was sitting next to them. Oh, okay, he's, he's will. I said, you're, you're still you, shouting. You gave him a will hunting. I said, I said the the most wise cracking thing ever. Oh, I was like, okay. <laughs> I, it's about to be good. Say say it. I said, I said it wasn't his soul. It wasn't money or a diamond. It was a light bulb. And they looked at me like I was like the biggest asshole in the room. <laughs> Use your brain. <laughs> but anyway, but the but but the discussion I wanted to ask though too is oh, okay. we're actually dis- we're actually having discussion. Well, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I was setting it up, for the, and so I was thinking to myself when I first saw when I first first saw Pulp Fiction for the very first time with Virgin Eyes, I thought it was his soul. So I've never my, thought that. My question I'm proposing to you guys, <clears throat> what did you guys think upon Virgin Eyes watching Pulp Fiction? What was in that briefcase? I had no thoughts on it whatsoever. Yeah, I didn't. <clears throat> I, 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 but I, honestly, <laughs> I, I can't, I'm not the right person to ask because I have not seen Pulp Fiction from beginning to end. Oh, really? No. What? Interesting. No, I've seen... You went to film school and you haven't seen Pulp Fiction? Pulp Honestly, Pulp. they never talked about Pulp Fiction really in the what? film school. No. Yeah. I'm, okay, well, I'm, the co- colored me surprised. Yeah, I don't know. I, th- I just thought it was... I mean, the, as my childhood brain, I thought it was drugs, hmm. you know, but it lit lights up and I'm like, man, drugs are shiny. And then, you know, as I, <laughs> as I got older, I'm like... Shiny cocaine. I'm sure Tarantino was trying to be so clever or something and get people to talk about it. So there was no yeah. real answer. You can infer all the stuff. I like the idea of the soul, Marcellus Wallace's soul. It's kind of yeah. interesting, and the fact that he's trying to get it back yeah. is also pretty interesting. It's yeah. kind of like the the folder situation in Whiplash. Yeah, mm. like where did it go? Does it matter? Doesn't matter. It's yeah. a, it's it's a catalyst. In this yeah. case, it's not a catalyst. It's the uh, it's the the climax. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, I, I thought that was like a little fun story that I had. Before, a tiny little fun story. <laughs> that was super fun. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand this assault that's like, coming towards me you're like, today. You recap a clever thing that you said at a bar. And you set it up like, this was the most clever thing that I've get ever said. Wait, get ready. You guys, I can't wait. I was thinking I about it all week. Come on, man. That was, a, my, hi, that, that was my high note. <laughs> it was a light bulb, yeah. That was the, that was the uh, jerk was a, store I, moment. I, I was <laughs> saying, it was a light bulb. Very Come good. on! That, that was How a, drunk were you when you said that? I, I, I was half in the bag. Okay, so take that into consideration. <laughs> when you're drunk, you don't dance as good as you think you do. Know. Your jokes are not <laughs> as funny as they think they are. <laughs> Jack, can can everybody chime in and say, was that a good anecdote? <laughs> I thought it was. Was, Come was, on. Light, was light bulb the zinger that he thought? Was it a will hunting moment? I, yeah, I said I said it was a light bulb because it was a light bulb. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Before we move on to uh, Joseph, we got some comments in the chat. David mm-hmm. Rosens from Piecing It Together. Hi, David. He says, I'm a sauce head, but it's marinara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrew Martin from Cult of Cinema says, Morgan uh, Spurlock also added himself as being a rapist. 
Oh, geez. that's interesting. Joe Bridges says, as someone who worked on a chicken farm, Spurlock's chicken industry doc was actually really good. And Kevin from Real Spoiler says that Tyler, you're right. It's one of the most mainstream documentaries he can think of. And it definitely was responsible for getting the general public interested in them. Well, that, finally, someone, <laughs> someone's on my side. That and Jackass. What, Jackass? <laughs> mainstream documentary? Jackass oh, yeah. is a mainstream <laughs> documentary. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then there's some also recommendations. Let's see. Where is... What is the, the recommend? What is the recommendation here? Well, Super High Me is from Doug Benson's documentary that was kind of oh, a that one's, of yeah, there. that one sucked. Yeah, I, I don't I think that's like the that same one. same kind of concept, but uh, it kind of is. But Par- it, Paradise mm. Lost is what uh, Andrew says you should watch. Tyler mm. he says it's way better than anything Morgan ever did. Okay, yeah. So that's. I mean, there's a lot of things that are way better than anything. All right. So, anyways, uh, Joseph, what do you got? What I have? Okay. So I have one kind of Tyler type news story where it's like a story time. Oh, okay. Alfonso, the director, Alfonso Cuaron, director of Children of Men and Gravity and Roma and uh, Itu Mama Tambien. Mm-hmm. He uh, was confused by being offered to direct a, the Prisoner of Azkaban, the Harry Potter, third movie in the Harry Potter franchise. One of the best. And found, yeah. it, and found mm-hmm. it really weird. Um, and then <laughs> Guero del Toro called him an arrogant asshole. Mm. <laughs> I like Guillermo del Toro. I like almost everything he does and says. Yeah. <laughs> he called him an arrogant asshole. He, he called him an arrogant asshole. He just asshole. said he didn't know what it was about. <laughs> uh, so He's uh, like, why are they contacting me? I am a filmmaker. Exactly. This is a stupid series. Alfonso Cuaron uh, directed the third movie. Uh, Chris Columbus, director of Home Alone, uh, did the first one, Sorcerer's Stone and uh, Chamber of Secrets. But then Cuaron was offered to direct the third one, which he found was strange because just given his track record so far. I was confused because it was completely not on my radar. I I speak often with Guillermo del Toro, and a couple of days after, I said, you know, they offered me this Harry Potter film, but it's really weird they offer me this. Del Toro then realized what an opportunity the Harry Potter franchise was, so he gave his longtime friend and fellow director some tough love. (laughs) He said, wait, 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 wait. You you you, You said you haven't read Harry Potter? I said, I don't think it's for me. In very florid lexicon in Spanish, he said, you are an arrogant asshole. (laughs) (laughs) Elitist. Uh, Quran. Del Toro's words were even even more harsh, as Quran revealed at the Telluride Film Festival in 2018. Del Toro actually launched into a tirade and said, fucking skinny, you're such a fucking arrogant bastard. You're you're going right now (laughs) to the fucking bookshop and get the books, and you're going to read them, and you call me right away when you're done. (laughs) When he talks to you like that, well, you have to go to the bookshop, Corin admitted. <laughs> I called Detro and said, well, the material is really great. He says, well, you see, you fucking, I mean, it's just untranslatable from the Spanish. And this is the film's 20th anniversary. President Azkaban? Yes. Nice. A franchise producer, David Heyman, said he had just had a hunch that Corin was the right person for the job, even if on paper it was a strange choice. This is from the producer. I'd seen Itumama Tambien, which I loved. And I oddly thought he'd be the perfect director for the third Potter. Um, that's not what some might think. You, can you imagine what some thought Harry, Ron, and Hermione would get up to? Uh, Itumama was, oh, a, yeah. <laughs> was about the last moments of being a teenager, and Azkaban was about the first moments of being a teenager. I, I felt he could make the show feel, in a way, more contemporary and just bring his cinematic wizardry. Mm. Um, Ooh, nice wordplay. So it was, <laughs> like a, it, was, it was a reach. So this producer saw, saw some sort of connection between the style mm. of movie or the story of movie that he made and how that how that could fit in a essentially children's movie. Mm-hmm. I think I, I, that's, I, I can see, I can see that. Well, the once Azkaban comes to the series, it becomes way darker too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It takes, have. it takes a little bit of a, of a turn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Tro- towards a more mature main audience. characters are being slaughtered like left and right in the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely. Like that fucking person just died. They just wizarded them to death. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> they gave them the old, uh, what do they call it? Av- 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 Avocadarva or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It, <laughs> I don't, I don't, exactly. I don't just like that. Yeah. That's, a, that's the one thing I don't like about Harry Potter is you could just, if you don't like someone, you just do that spell. Yeah, but it's illegal. You can do that with a gun. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, called but, murder. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's like processes that you have to go to get a gun. You get a you're giving a a, a very hormonal child a wand. That's why they don't teach him the Avocadabra. But oh, also, you, you could, but you also, you, could read it. you don't just later. like you don't just like, later. You don't just say the word and it happens. 
Yeah. Like them, le- them learning the spells of like doing. How the, does even le- learning a spell work? I thought it was just you point the wand and say the word no. and then it just happens. As, mo- as, as shown in the movie when they're learning the Leviosa yeah. and she's like, it's not Leviosa. It's, Leviosa. It's, it's, it's a very specific enunciation and passion you have to have. So that's, that's <laughs> my <laughs> problem with the way that Voldemort says Abracadabra. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He mumbles them. Is it he just. <laughs> and then. <laughs> yeah. And if you, if you put the wrong emphasis. On the wrong syllable of Leviosa, yeah, it doesn't work. A little contradictory there. <laughs> and he just yeah. mumbles his way through. He's a mumblecore He's wizard. He's just so so powerful He's so good. that he can just have the enough feeling. That's like that saying yeah. the words and enunci- like enunciating the words doesn't matter. It's like how Superman it's... flies faster. He just thinks really hard about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm faster now. <laughs> Why don't you fly everywhere? Why don't you run everywhere? <laughs> That's what I don't right, like. Barry but, B. Benson. but yeah, that's what I don't like about Harry Potter. It's just it, it's it's Oh, that's a Jew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Tyler, Tyler says there's too many gremlins in that or whatever. That's where that conversation came from. It stemmed from that. It's him. You're like, right, it is. I totally forgot. <laughs> it's you, I saw those goblins and immediately I thought of a Jewish person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so obvious. Oh, like, it's so on, it, it is, Tyler. No, it is. It, oh, it's, that's a Jew. <laughs> no, I'm not anti-Semitic or anything like that. I'm just saying. But like, what else can, could it be? Something, <laughs> that's something someone an anti-Semitic you, person you would say. Literally, <laughs> could, you could literally infer like what they were going for. That was literally like, I'm not racist. But <laughs> it's not. I'm racist. But it's it's. <laughs> I'm racist. But also, that's a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought it was an offensive. I thought I thought the, stereotype that you I agree with. Was, I, the, 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 I don't agree with, and you're endangering my life now. In the chat, Brianna says, "In Hogwarts leg- Legacy, you just crucio everyone without consequence. Yeah, death, true. death, death, <laughs> and you're dead, and you're dead. Yeah, I think it's yeah. funny in that game. There's no you could just cast as many spells as you want, and it's literally just kill, 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 <laughs> kill, yeah. kill. Why do any other spell? Just kill. I mean, this, that, that's the same logic that I'm applying to for Harry Potter. <laughs> just, you get yeah, a I'm talking you, about the Harry Potter game. Well, I, I'm, well, yeah, but in the Harry Potter universe, they're giving these children wands in which they could just read a book about a spell and just be like, oh, this is the death spell. You're dead. You're dead. And you're dead. And then and then they try and then they have what like the wizard police. They could they, they could just the kid could just <laughs> say police. you're dead. You're dead. Yeah, you're dead. All right. Anyways. Yeah, that's all I have. Do you, I mean, I would just go into stream picks or do you have a news story? No, I just wanted to... Ross was my news story. So. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I guess let's do some stream picks. All right. You ready, Tyler? Movies. I am. Want to watch a movie? Yes, yes, I do. Disney Plus. Oh, HBO Max. If I don't get the pick, show's over. I have grown accustomed to Hulu Plus. Amazon Prime. I like Netflix. You from the pick? Streaming picks. Movies that we watch this week on our streaming services that you can watch on yours, too. Tyler, what do you got? So it is the 40th anniversary of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I decided I want to watch that. Now, what makes the first one, the original one? I don't know if anybody could see this. Yeah. The team had a sticker recently. Newest sticker to my water bottle. Yeah. It's a PCM sticker. Yeah. It's a badass sticker. So what makes it, what makes the 40th anniversary different from just the original is the 39th anniversary. (laughs) What makes it different than last year's anniversary? Okay, yeah, I guess you could say that. So, <laughs> you, you threw me off there for a second. Um, so, the MPI Media Group uh, presented the original film restored from an all-new 4K scan authorized, authorized by director Toby Hooper and featuring a dynamic new 7.1 surround sound mix. Uh, yeah, this was awesome. It was really cool, even through my shitty computer screen and my my headphones are actually really good. So like I I could really hear the difference in sound because when you watch the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's a little grainy, which I appreciate as well. It, the, the, it, but having it restored in 4K and having the new sound, it was truly an experience. And that's streaming on Freevee. And... The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favorite slasher film, mm-hmm. like of all time. Like I, I even though I bear the a face of Michael Myers on my arm, which I regret to this day. Strangely, I get the most compliments on it. I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre is better than Halloween, huh. just because it doesn't take much. <laughs> what? What was that? He says oh. it doesn't take much. 
take what do you it mean? It doesn't take much because to be better than because Halloween. Halloween's not a great movie. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I, I I don't I don't agree with that. But <laughs> the reason why I like Texas Chainsaw Massacre the, the more than Halloween is that there it feels a lot more passionate as a movie than any other slasher just because of the if you know the context of the filming conditions it the movie hits a little bit harder and <laughs> was, so i was reading comments oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was gonna say, I was like why push, why push is through, it push, push through tyler through. push through i'm just saying okay so the uh, 40th anniversary of texas chainsaw massacre is streaming on freebie and it is a delight, like Pete would say. It's it's so cool to see it in this HD and improved sound, just because like when you juxtaposition it from the like original film, like the original, it's it's really good. Really, it's it's just really good. Re- do you, do you have any other streaming picks besides that? Mm-hmm. You can let me, you can, let me think. Yeah, you can say no. You can also say yes. Just well, don't lie to this. I'm sure you didn't letterbox this. <clears throat> Log it. I didn't. I didn't. I did not letterbox Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I should have though. But you should letterbox everything so you can actually yeah, go back I know, and I get your thoughts together, kind of cohesive. I w- I, w- I was. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I just, I, I just been so busy. Like, you I, can do it the second you finish the movie. No, I mean, like, just like as far as going to watch movies, I've just been so busy. So, but you watched the movie. I did. What do you do? What do you do immediately after the movie? Put your pants on and then, and then go <laughs> and then come here and come here. <clears throat> I like David Rosen's comment. <laughs> Halloween is iconic and also not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay well yeah, we I have a lot of conversation because i know that every time joseph and i say that halloween's not a great movie it triggers a lot of people yeah it does kevin, it, it, kevin from really spoiler says it's a masterpiece yes uh, andrew from cult of cinema says it's iconic and it's very difficult that's very difficult to achieve <laughs> brianna love of my life says halloween ends is the best film of the series which i agree with <laughs> I number that, one, uh, number one, <laughs> and then <laughs> Joe Bridges says Halloween and Texas Chainsaw, Chainsaw Massacre are both horror masterpieces. Done, n- don't know why. Done, know why only one can be. Mm. Don't know why only one. Can uh, yeah, be. I, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think they they both can be. And well, then David Rosen says exactly that Halloween is iconic and also not good. God damn it! But man, Texas I, Chainsaw Massacre is amazing. Yes, it is. So I mean, I, I think it's possible to be iconic and also not g- a great movie in retrospect. I just, mm. I just, it does, it's still, I think, second on the Halloween rankings for me. Mm. Um, I think that's what I, where it landed when I ranked them. Second, I think, well, I, second I, or maybe third even. Halloween mm. one and Halloween three are my favorite Halloween movies. Halloween three is like my fifth from third from the bottom. Mm. I don't like it. Oh, it's oh, okay. Well, there's I, some stinkers in that series, but oh yeah, it just I don't know that H two O. The the Tom Atkins as the protagonist, who's basically a rapist. <laughs> you're like. He lost me. <laughs> this guy? He's out cheating on his wife with the 17-year-old, like, and he's like 45. Yeah. And he's like, I have to save this town with my mustache. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, yeah that, that's something that you kind of have to overlook. Name days, no but, Halloween, um, Halloween. And also, I wanted to mention the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake back from 2003. I A mm. lot of people don't like that movie. but the Jessica I, Biel one, right? Yeah, the Jessica Biel one. I thought that one was really good, too. And that one was pretty <laughs> effective. Yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah. so For a 11 or 12-year-old me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very... It has the same effect as... Um, <clears throat> like a saw or something where it's just very visceral. Oh God, I don't want to watch this, but yeah. here I am. You when know? he puts that guy in that hook and then puts yeah. the salt yeah. on the uh, severed limb wound. Yeah. yeah that, that was rough. That was rough. And the nails going uh, down the stairwell. Ugh. And then I watched a uh, two letter show um, that I will not mention. A two letter show? Yeah. Or no, two word show. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> two, <laughs> two letter show. Two word show that I won't mention, but mm. other than that. Watch that's... another show. Yeah. I have no time in the world, so I'm going to watch this show that I've seen before. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of bringing value to the show. What are you talking about? I just did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Joseph, what do you got? What do I have? Hold on. Let me... I made this mistake last week. Yeah. Here I am. Heaven forbid. There we go. Okay. So, I watched a few movies I'm going to talk about. I, do you just want to do Furiosa when you talk about it? Yeah, I, I, watched, I watched... Joseph and I both watched Furiosa and also Stop Making Sense. 
Oh, you watched this? I, 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 yeah, I watched it this morning. Oh, cool. I would love to talk about that. So first of the week, I watched Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, hell yeah. The only scene I've seen from that movie before watching it was the Alec Baldwin pitching the contest. Yeah. Greatest opening scene once. And that's the only scene he's in. <laughs> yeah, it's the <laughs> greatest one scene character, too, from a movie. Yeah. And it's essentially the story of the movie is kind of like a Wolf of Wall Street type storyline where all these like real estate agents are like have a sales contest that only the top two will keep their job by the end of it. Yeah. Mm. If you don't, if you don't make the top two, you are fired. And yeah. the first prize is a car. It's a Cadillac, Cadillac Eldorado. Cadillac. And the second prize is a set of steak knives. Steak knives. <laughs> the third place is you're fired. I, um, I, I love the that. The good mono. news is you're them. fired. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck you. That's my name. <laughs> yeah. I drove down here in an $80,000 BMW. You drove down here in a Hyundai. That's my name. I made yeah. nine hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in in a last year or something like that. But this is a very much like a dialogue heavy movie because it's just a bunch of sales guys making yeah. cold calls. Ed Jack Harris, Lemmon. Kevin Spacey, the Ro- old man uh, Robert De Niro. Yeah, no, Robert, not De Niro. No, uh, Al Pacino. Alec, ba- Alec Baldwin too. What, what, yeah, he already mentioned yeah. that. Al, oh, Al Pacino oh, sorry, is no. in it. Um, Kevin Spacey. Spacey, the late yeah, it was Kevin a, Spacey. It was a, the, the, the late, he, he, died, he died? He's not with us he anymore? Dead to me. Pretty much. And Jack Lemmon, right? He's the old, older guy. And uh, Jonathan Price as well. Uh, oh, for, I forgot he's in it. For To a lesser degree. Yeah. But, but yeah, this was good. This was a well-written, very entertaining movie for the subject matter that it is. I wasn't sure if I would be too enthralled with it just based on what I knew. But it was well done. The The dialogue is pretty, is really pretty fast paced when they're um, in discussion and the, uh, there's some nefarious things that happen to get the leads, like these like golden leads that mm-hmm. uh, are being kept away from the these sales the people Gary leads. because they, you, they're only for people who close and uh, the older gentleman, Jack Lemon, right? Yeah. He's probably one of the most charismatic, interesting characters in the whole thing because there's like a, he's like a two sidedness to his character but, but yeah, for this was released in 1992, and um, hey, same year as Fringley. Same year, was the year <laughs> yeah. of my birth. Yeah, the year of my birth uh, as well. Did you know that Jack Lemmon's character in that is the basis of the character of Gil in The Simpsons? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gil, you done it again, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. I just wanted to tell you, I almost made I a sale. I almost made a sale. <laughs> Buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I'll make sure to make one before I come home. Yeah. Hey, oh, Gil, you got to get yourself into a pickle this time, Gil. Oh, don't put him on at the first, phone. At first, he was sympathetic. <laughs> like, oh, hey. <laughs> in the beginning, he was like more of a sympathetic character because like he has this kind of backstory <laughs> of his family. and But then by the end of it, he becomes very uh, likable. Yeah. And, and Kevin Spacey basically just tells him like... When, when he's kind of begging to keep his job or begging to get the leads, Spacey's I don't like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're so, it's, it's one of the most cut, cutting, the movies with the most cutting dialogue to, yes. to characters. Yes. It, it, they're very, very <clears throat> much not, uh, they're very much against each other, uh, at each other's throats a little bit in this. There is number one, Joe Bridges in the chat says he can't wait for Tyler's eulogy of Kevin Spacey and he'll be oddly loving for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he was a good man. Yeah. A lot of great things about him. Yeah. A lot of great things. Yeah. A couple bad, but mostly good. <laughs> um, <laughs> just the one thing. People latch on to it for some yeah, reason. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is, it, I'll post on our Facebook page, there's a SNL sketch where Alec Baldwin re- plays his character from this movie. Oh, really? But he's a, he's the head elf in a toy workshop. Oh, yeah. And he's talking down to all the elves. <laughs> and he's, like, he's basically, what you, what you doing out here? You making toys? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. You know, A always B, B. A always B, B, C closing. Yeah. Always B. I think it's like always be toy tinkering or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> ABT, always be tinkering. It's really good. It's almost line for line, except for they drop out the uh, F slur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that's uh, streaming on Netflix. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. Super accessible. This next one is also streaming on Netflix, and it's kind of related to our, our interview with uh, Ross. Cool. Peter John Ross, PJR. This is the anti-social network, Memes to Mayhem. Mm. And this is essentially about the creation of Q. And, oh, yeah. And how it started. It started from 2chan, which was in Japan, and then it evolved into 4chan and then to yeah. 8chan. Mm-hmm. And... Essentially, how everything that led up to where the world we live in now is partly a part of that is responsible for this whole thing, this social media, 4chan, 8chan to then evolve to Q is because of 
like just making jokes on the internet that just evolved into conspiracy theories to then real life consequences yeah. of our <clears throat> political you what we have jokes yeah and how it shows like some of the creators of 4chan and they would go to um uh, like conventions like back in the early days and they would have like panel yeah and then all these like all these people all these young people going to this convention and just being kind of like the most unpolitically correct yeah, people hate, gathered yeah. in a room hateful yeah and obviously what they're doing is hateful they're playing like they're they're doing like the the Heil five or whatever they're oh, do- yeah. hailing hitler they're doing they're playing like the german like anthem like oh, okay, back yeah. in the day and it's like, they're just being like in really in bad taste joking and, yeah but obviously that turned into and evolved into the Q conspiracies. Mm-hmm. Did you ever go on 4chan when you were young? And no, that was never for me. Hmm. Honestly, what about I, you, I, and I never just I didn't I just discovered it like probably way too late. Oh, yeah. I I have a family and friends, so I I don't go on 4chan. Wow. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one. Yeah, the and there was like <laughs> they kind of talked about like how it kind of led to incel behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what starts as a joke quickly snowballed into the joke of <laughs> the joke of reality that we are currently living in, <laughs> and it's a. And it's it's a really well made documentary. There's like really great production and like these animated interstitials that are uh, kind of akin to a Spider Verse type animation. And it's uh, it's really well done. And kind of it has a bleak sort of ending though. It doesn't make you feel hopeful. You should mm. you should also watch Q Into the Storm if you haven't. I think I might have seen that. It's like a four part series. They find the supposedly the person who is Q. Yeah, yeah, I think I have seen that. Yeah, it's also it's a good pairing with this one. I haven't seen this one. It's been on my watch list though. Yeah, it's it's very that's it, on Max. Interesting, intriguing, and uh, it was it was a good watch, entertaining. Hmm. Was that on Netflix? You said yeah, Netflix. Okay, cool. Next stream pick streaming on Amazon Prime. I caught up. So Challengers, directed by Luca Guanino, is out right now. Yep. that's not what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, his previous work, Bones and All. Ooh. A, a movie about cannibal lovers and um wow. it's starring uh, taylor ross and timothy chalamet as the leads and mark rylance is also uh plays a character and is honestly one of the best parts of this movie <coughs> i really wasn't sure what to expect of what going to this movie what i knew about it i knew it was about cannibals but it's like such a weird unique twisted romance romantic story mm-hmm. and they're cannibals okay and mark Ry- mark rylance is the fucking creepiest guy in that goddamn movie are they really. affluent cannibals no like, they are not they're okay. it's treated as like a condition like oh. an unknown condition like okay. vampires almost a little bit yeah I, that's kind of like how i thought about it as well the main character, who is uh, played by Taylor Ross, she is being raised by her dad, and he is he sh- he's aware of her condition. There's an incident where she goes, which she goes, <laughs> cannibalism is a condition. <laughs> she goes to a she goes to a sleepover. She she like sneaks out of her house at night and goes to a sleepover, and then she like bites this girl's finger off, and then she runs away goes home and the dad's like, he didn't do that. And then they're like, they're basically start packing up and we have to escape town before the cops show up. Right. Yeah. And that's basically what their life is like. They just have to keep skipping town because Mm -hmm. she keeps eating people. (laughs) She keeps getting into incidences like that. And uh, she hadn't, apparently she hadn't had something like that happen for a long time. And now this was the first time because she never goes out and hangs out with anybody by herself. Mm -hmm. And then they escape town but then the next morning, her dad has left her and left her a note or left her a tape recording that is played throughout the movie because she plays it like kind of just interstitially mm-hmm. like throughout and just is a narration from him and like him explaining like like what ha- like the first time that she did it as a baby and then kind of mm-hmm. like his reasoning and why. Yeah. Um, and the mom is not in the picture at all. And then she um, meets up with Mark Rylance's character I can't remember his name, but he is fucking wacky. He is so creepy. I like Mark Rylance in general. He's he's great, but it's he's so he's insane. And he is also a cannibal and he finds her because he can he can there's like a sense that these cannibals have that they can like smell each other out. <laughs> they can like sniff each other out from a half mile away. <laughs> and they can tell when the other person it's hasn't ludicrous. hasn't fed in like a while. 
<laughs> Everything about it sounds like vampire lore, except for they're just more played like cannibals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are cannibals. Mm-hmm. And it is also very uh, gross and disgusting. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the practical effects are very well done. And uh, yeah, I would recommend this, definitely. I gave it like a, almost a five-star review. Really? Wow. Yeah, four and a half. I mean, Luca doesn't seem like he can miss, to be honest. Yeah. I'm very lo- excited for Challengers. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a really solid movie and really well made. Just looks really good. And again, Mark Rylance, <clears throat> fucking like the best part of the movie. Even though he's not in it like the whole time, uh-huh. he's great. He's mm. he's the best part of a lot of movies that he's in. Don't look up. Ready Player One. This one apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's fantastic. Let's see. Yeah, let's go to Stop Making Sense. Okay. Stop Making Sense is not a traditional movie. It's a concert movie. Yeah. Talking Heads, iconic concert stage production that is essentially being built in the very beginning of the movie. It starts off with just David Byrne and a guitar, and then they slowly add an, like another a person, another musician, mm-hmm. and a, like a whole, like they roll in the drum sets, they roll in the keyboards for each different song. As just like a person who enjoys like live music, it's really enjoyable to watch. I was, I'm like, I've never gone into Talking Heads as like, I've never explored the discography too much. Uh-huh. I just know <clears throat> Psycho Killer, Bring Down the House. This is the place. This is the place, or this must be the place. Yeah, this must be the place. Could be the place. This could be. Might as well be the Potentially place. Potentially <laughs> would be the place. And they also, they could be giants. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible they're giants. It's possible that they are giants. <laughs> I think if I was like a bigger fan of of Talking Hands and had a little bit more history with their music, I would probably like really, really love this. Mm. But just as someone who enjoys like live music and is semi-familiar with their music, it was uh, super entertaining to watch. It was, I, I was watching the audience though, because the audiences they have seats like from from the like the front row to the back it's just all it's all like seating mm-hmm. i know people are standing up by the end but i feel like the seats just get in the way <laughs> yeah it's it's a weird thing the decision for you know the concert uh, i guess the venue mm-hmm. to decide to put seats in the pit yeah. or leave it open yeah. it just depends on the type of music i think really yeah. and the crowd but mm-hmm. i feel like the the talking heads heads yeah would really appreciate being able to get weird in the in the pit instead of just sitting around yeah yeah and watching watching a young david Byrne, i was like i know <laughs> killing killian murphy just did oppenheimer as a biopic but if they were to but... make if they were if they were to make <laughs> for sure him, uh, him as as david Byrne, he really looked like him or maybe like david desmalchian too pretty pretty similar a little bit yeah. but i i felt like a like a cross between the two of them yeah i think if killian murphy was younger yeah, yeah, uh, they, definitely. That that ship has sailed a little bit for yeah. that. But yeah, so and that's streaming on HBO uh, Max. Yeah, Max. Correct. I I uh, Talking Heads is like my one of my top ten favorite bands of all time. Mm. So I'm definitely biased there. But yeah, this is. If you don't like the music, I'm sure you'll probably obviously not enjoy it as nearly as much. But it's directed by Jonathan Demi. Yeah, guy fucking directed Science of the Lambs, and yeah. he directed this concert documentary. Uh-huh. And it's a very interesting construction because it is they're they're constructing the the set the whole stage, stage as mm-hmm. the show goes on. It starts with just him on an acoustic guitar doing a strip like a stripped down basic version of Psycho Killer, mm-hmm. and then his bass player comes out and she starts getting into another song, and then his next song is two people, and you're kind of thinking it's, it feels like a little bit of a waste missing like half of the band yeah. through the first couple songs, but it doesn't feel like that at all. <clears throat> It really feels like, you know, I've mentioned this before with Whiplash because Whiplash is a movie I'm very passionate about and music in general. Mm -hmm. But at the very beginning of Whiplash, they do, he does the, the, the slow percussion hits on the snare drum. Mm -hmm. One, one, two, one, two, Mm -hmm. one, two, one, Mm -hmm. two, one, two, one, two. And then it goes into a full drum roll. And then in the, in the finale, that's a classic Buddy Rich solo thing is he has the big drum roll and he slows it down into individual strikes of the, yeah. And it's almost like reminding you that this percussive loud song this like em- emotional connection and vibe of the music that you feel really stripped down is just a bunch of people either banging a stick against a drum or strum a, a bunch of strings and it's like when you have a nine piece band that comes together to make something that really hits you like you know psycho killer or you know whatever it might be it's it all is just this fucking guy and david Byrne specifically is the creative mind behind all that just like um i can't remember the guy's name John Lynn from ELO. 
I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's like the creative mastermind behind ELO, Electric Light Orchestra. Mm-hmm. And David Byrne is the creative mastermind here. And he's just a fucking weirdo. Yeah. And yeah. the documentary highlights his weirdness. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's almost like him, like Nathan Fielder and him could be weird blood brothers in a way. <laughs> they he, both wear big suits. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I have <laughs> zero zero chance that that had no inspiration. This had no inspiration on the giant suit that Nathan Fielder wears. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I absolutely love this. It's a five star for me. Yeah, it's B- great. But my bias shows because I love Talking Heads. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I watched uh, I watched the Great Wall, the Matt Damon <laughs> Great Wall of China movie. Jeff Lynn, thank you, Joe Bridges. That was not great at all. Going what into it, wait, what? To, what compelled you to watch it? I've heard it was so bad, I had to see for myself. Dude, mm. what the fuck? <laughs> and it wasn't what I was expecting. Going into it, I was like, there's no way they're trying to pass off Matt Damon as like an Asian person. <laughs> Were they? <laughs> no, they weren't. <laughs> he, he, was, he was not supposed to be from it's like China. Or, it's a real Last Samurai situation. Uh, <laughs> surprisingly enough, Pedro Pascal is also in this. Oh, okay. Is he playing Chinese also? No, he's a Spaniard. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course he is. But yeah, it's like a monster movie. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. It's like, oh, really? It's like a monster movie. So they, they did the Noah thing? Kind of, I guess. Where they put monsters in a... He was like, why was the Great Wall of China built? And they like retcon like this, they, they make it a fantasy like mm, monster okay. movie. Yeah. Oh, so it's more like lore. It's like a storytelling of lore or something. Yeah. It was like, some, some, some of the stories are true. Some are legend. This is one of the legends. That's what it says in the movie. Oh, okay. But yeah, that was not great. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Interesting. It's directed by Yimo Zhang, mm-hmm. who also did Hero, one of my favorites. Yeah. So he went from Hero to, to, this. to this. The Great Wall, <laughs> starring Matt Damon and Tian Jing and Willem Dafoe. Oh, yeah. Hey. I forgot Willem Dafoe was in it, too. <laughs> Willem Dafoe is in it. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Why not? Just throw him in there. <clears throat> but yeah, not to watch. Put Kevin Spacey in there, too. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then and then I watched Furiosa. I don't know if you want to just jump into Let's that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk about Furiosa. Okay. We, uh, we both watched Come Furiosa. Three up. Yeah. Tyler, did you watch Furiosa? No. No? No, I haven't. You said you were very excited about Are it. Are you going to? I, I, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. I'm probably going to see it tomorrow, actually. Okay. I've heard that before. Yeah. Please report back. I'm very curious to hear what you think. <laughs> no, I no, I, 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 I did plan on because going to the theater tomorrow. Because uh, I read joseph's review on it oh you didn't you read it on letterboxd i mm-hmm. just because i was i was hard i wasn't i wasn't sure how to interpret your text message joseph <laughs> sent me a text message after the movie was over because we'll usually text each other if we're going to be watching the same movie and be like you know you know how do you think do you guys go together no no, no separately oh. and he just sent me an emoji he just said he said furiosa with a, a, a face with the line for the mouth like a blank face oh just uh, yeah, like a blank face and i wasn't sure if it was like it was so good it blew, blew me away <laughs> or it was really bad and I'm, I'm disappointed. Very mm-hmm. cryptic. And I put... You put a check mark. I put a check. I didn't watch... I didn't rate it yet because I wanted to think about it. And it, yeah. I, was, I was very confused about my feelings when I watched it, you know, much like college. I was very mm-hmm. confused about my feelings about <laughs> Wait, a lot of what? things. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I got to ruminate on it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think that if it wasn't for the fantastic practical work with the cars and stuff, I'd probably have it about a four star but there really was a lot of things that like tr- dropped my jaw fig- figurati- figuratively and literally mm-hmm. in the theater when I'm thinking, wow, they just fucked up a lot of great practical effects for this one shot. Mm-hmm. And when that 15 minute action sequence that we talked about on one of the news stories a couple weeks ago came in, mm-hmm. I, I was just one thing after another was like, that fucking guy skating on the on the sand or skating on the rock <laughs> mm-hmm. with his like because I saw his shoes in the shot prior and I'm like that's a weird shoe and then all of a sudden he's like skate uh, he's uh, uh, yeah, yeah. skiing behind the car and then he pulls a fucking parachute out and starts flying and you're like oh my god <laughs> they're coming from the sky yeah <laughs> it was like all, all of that stuff I really really loved so but there was a lot of parts about the story and Annie Taylor Joy felt very much out of place in the, in the character mm-hmm. and there was a lot of stuff in the story that I was like. I don't know how I feel about this. A little bit of overacting in some scenes and some un- like unnecessary stuff with uh, Chris Hemsworth. Mm-hmm. I really ultimately loved his character. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And I thought that it was nice to put a little levity into the series that with Fury Road, it got almost no levity whatsoever. Mm. I love Fury Road. And in my opinion, it's damn near a perfect movie. It's a five-star banger, 100%. Every time I watch it, never yeah. never loses its fastball. Yeah. But the thing that I really liked about <clears throat> Furioso is that a movie that I love, Fury Road, it took a lot of the stuff that kind of leaves open-ended questions, which I didn't even care about the questions. I was like, I don't need a f- sequel. I don't need yeah. a prequel for this damn movie. It's yeah. standalone. It works on its own. Mm-hmm. Right, right. But the prequel that I got answered so many questions that I didn't know I wanted answered. 
Mm. So I feel like as a prequel, you can shit the bed and lose the, lose the vibe of the series in a lot of different ways. George Miller, I think, did exactly what you should do with the sequel, which is answer questions that were popped up from the one that came before it, mm. give you an interesting like origin story, and then also there was there was a, a marked change in the character of Furiosa throughout the movie. <clears throat> I'm like, this does not feel like Charlize Theron's Furiosa at all. No, it doesn't. She doesn't talk like her. She doesn't act like her. She gives the, the ridiculous, like when the explosion happens behind her or whatever, and she's against the gate, she like looks directly at the camera and it's got this like supermodel look like blue steel from Zoolander. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't like that. Magnum. There's Magnum, bro. <laughs> I didn't like that. That's it. But there was a character of Jack, Praetorium Jack, that she becomes like a mentor to her, and he felt more like Furiosa than she did. Mm-hmm. And I'm watching this character, and I'm like, this dude's badass. Well, I mean, it this is- This dude's so, fucking badass. It He's, is supposed to be a prequel, though, so- um, What I'm saying is that she didn't even seem like the same character from the movies. Mm. But then she's introduced to this character, Jack, and she spends like the last th- the third act with, with him. Mm-hmm. And all of that- I was like, this guy's Furiosa. He yeah. actually f- reminded me more of uh, Mel Gibson from the original series and just this cool, stoic, calm and collected sort of dude. Yeah. And she's something different. After it was all said and done and I ruminated on it a little bit, I'm like, maybe maybe he rubbed off on her. He imprinted on her near the end of their time together and then she became the person that she is now. Mm-hmm. And there's a little, this is not a spoiler, but there's a one very small shot on the, like, the side of her face at the very last scene of the movie that they use Charlie Theron in. Really? Oh, yeah. And yeah. you're like, and it, you can't, it's not a full on face shot, but you're like, that's not Anna Taylor Joy. Well, then, I mean, you see the, the, the brides. Yeah. Whatever. And they go in and it's like, it literally yeah. leads right into the next movie, which is Fury Road. It was like a Rogue One, a New Hope situation. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. And you know that they probably just pulled the footage from the, uh, uh, the deleted scenes from Fury Road yeah. to do because they didn't they aren't going to shave Charlie's Theron's head for half a scene that you don't even see her face yeah, yeah. yeah she probably was like, like I'm the, not doing that that's <laughs> the benefit of George Miller taking his beloved property that he has so much invested in and being mm-hmm. able to do cool things with it that no other mm-hmm. filmmaker could do because he owns right. that and he has it probably on a hard drive somewhere yeah. yeah so that's I ended up giving it like four and a half stars that was really good I wish that they put the volume cranked the volume up a little higher in the theater I was in because mm-hmm. I didn't get that full percussive experience. Interesting. I'm curious as to what, how loud it was. It was not loud enough. Like I listened to mo- movies louder at home. You mm. know, really? It was almost like they had no bass, like separate bass in that theater. All treble, baby. It was like all, <laughs> it was yeah. It was like they had a like a sound bar in front, but no back like presence. Oh, okay. So I'm I weird. Want, I'm c- like considering going and seeing it in a Dolby Atmos theater just to get the full experience and see mm. if it elevates it. So that's that's my take on it. Gives your take, Joseph. I did not think this movie was very good. <laughs> really? Uh, I did not like this movie very much. I was pretty underwhelmed and... Did you have high expectations? Well, coming from Fury Road, yeah, I, had, I think had pretty high expectations. Yeah. I think that all of the everything that we got from the story of this movie could have been done in a flashback in Fury Road. Mm. There's only one thing that I can think of that I thought was intriguing enough to make her, to make her amputation more emotionally traumatic. Oh, that was a good reveal. Yeah. That was very good. Uh, and the whole time it was like, it was like watching hot tub time machine. And it's always just the part. Is this, is this <laughs> yeah. what happens? That's a great point. <laughs> is this where it happens? They're all like, ah. <laughs> it's yeah. the audience who's been waiting for it to happen. I thought that it was not very well paced. I thought it was a lot of lulls, especially in the first half of the movie. Hmm. I think we spent too much time with a very young Furiosa. Like we don't even see. Yeah. And uh, Anya and for like Joy. an hour in or something. Yeah, we don't see. Oh my her. god, yeah, really? It takes it takes a little bit. You know, an hour, but like forty five minutes. Maybe it felt long, and that's another thing. This movie felt like it was too long. I could I could use more. It was <laughs> it was. I was like, we get to it, they divide it up into like chapters, mm-hmm. like chapter markers, and there's like four of them. And then when the fourth one showed up, I was like, oh, another one? <laughs> <laughs> We're still going. <laughs> I th- and me and Deanna both didn't enjoy this movie. I when we came out of the theater. We felt that it was kind of unnecessary that this movie came out. And both me and Dan were like, I think that George Miller should take this movie back. I think he should unrelease this movie. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Because I don't think it does anything to enrich the world of the wasteland or add anything to Furiosa's character, minus that one thing about her losing 
her her arm mm-hmm. and what it means in trying to go back home. <laughs> what about yeah? What about her desire to go back home? I mean, she was more out for vengeance than anything than going back home in this movie. But then it sets up the next movie for her ultimate. But goal I have of enough information back. in Free Road already mm-hmm. for her wanting to go back home. And then if they were to add the, the information in a flashback, it would make it just that much more impactful. And uh, I don't think that uh, I was like. Watching Free Road, I was like, I could see why they would be making a Furiosa prequel. And I was intrigued by the idea of that. But then I watched the movie. And I was like, well, Furiosa is actually not that interesting. <laughs> 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 it turns out that we don't, I didn't feel like I needed to know more because I didn't get much. And uh, Chris Hemsworth was good at times. He's de- definitely over the top. Yeah. And the whole revenge mission thing of getting back to him. Mm-hmm. It felt a little bit odd, like oddly timed or an oddly placed within the movie. And by the time they have a confrontation and it get and it starts to get tense and interesting, mm-hmm. the movie's over. Mm. Um, so it, it's kind of like Fury Road was like one long action sequence from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. And it was captivating. It was like unlike anything, unlike any other action movie that I'd seen. They came out in 2015, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. And here we are nine years later. Which is crazy to think about. Yeah. <laughs> nine years since we got that banger. Nine years. I'm afraid it's been nine years. This was like, the action sequences in this were very few and far between. There was, yeah, it, this was, it's really hard because when you're taking, when you're comparing, it's it's impossible to not compare it to Fury Road. Mm-hmm. Just because it is what leads up to it. But like if you were to compare Fury Road to all the other Mad Maxes, it mm-hmm. blew all those out of the water too. Yeah. I don't I don't really see a whole lot of besides spawning this universe and obviously giving letting George Miller develop into the filmmaker that he is today, mm-hmm. I don't I don't really particularly care for many of the originals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah. the action is literally wall to wall in Fury Road. Yeah. It's like how do you live up to that? You're making a di- they're making a different movie with it. It's mm-hmm. a, it's a very story-based movie and I liked the story. Um, so that, that, that was the question I was going to ask both of you guys. If it wasn't based off of Fury Road, would it stand on its own legs as an okay um, movie? Yeah, I think I think so. I don't know. I think it probably would. If this came out first? And no, then we no if, it was, if, if, like, if it was unrelated to Fury Road. And the Mad Max universe? Yeah. I, still think I don't think so. I still think it's got mm. great world building. I like the idea. There's some fantastic shots, a wide helicopter shot of this marauding motorcycle gang dri- driving through the w- wilderness of, you know, the outback. Mm-hmm. And Chris Hemsworth, or sorry, Dr. Dementis's chariot. He's got one motorcycle in the front and then two behind it, like th- horses. And he's, yeah. drawn, he's on a drawn carriage, like a like a gladiator, you know? <laughs> yeah. What do they call that? I can't remember what they call it now. There's a name specifically named for it. A, cha- a chariot. Yeah, a chariot. Yeah, yeah, you just yeah. said it. A, a stand-up chariot. <laughs> um, but there's, I mean, there's a lot of very v- amazing visuals here. No, there is, definitely. And when I, I remembered the 15-minute action sequence going to the movie, but when I was watching the movie, I was like, is this it? Is this the one? I know you already said it was going to get in your craw waiting for it. <laughs> I was, but then, and it was over. I was like, did we see the 15 minute action sequence? That was it. That was it. It was like one thing after another. Now there's another vehicle. Now they throw in the, the spinning ass catcher or whatever. It felt like all of, <laughs> all of the sequences were just the, like the, were based around the war rig, mm-hmm. but we already got a bunch of those in Fury Road. Yeah. I think that some of them were less effective, the action sequences than the, than the stuff in Fury Road. Mm -hmm. But again, if I'm grading this just on its own for what it enriched, what it gave to me, if it enriched me or not, and I was thoroughly entertained. I definitely think that the Fury, the Mad Max movies, especially now, don't take themselves very seriously at all. And did they ever talk? I know. (laughs) Talking about like the levity of it, there's definitely levity within Fury Road because of the characters and how they're designed. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one, it feels like it's a, trying an attempt at attempting to be goofy or comedy like or may, comedic. Like maybe, as a, maybe as opposed to just like, look at this character. There's no mention that he has his nipples, like <laughs> nipples cut out yeah. and pierced. And, but they may bring attention to it in this. I'm like, I already knew that was there. It's almost like shoving your face in the joke. Yeah. Kind of thing. And then Chris Hemsworth was, he was goofy and fun. And it looked like he was having fun in that role, mm-hmm. but he just felt like he was being goofy for the sake of being goofy. Mm. Yeah, I feel like once they realized who he was embodying in the character, mm-hmm. they leaned into it a little bit more and just, it's almost like when you have an Adam McKay movie 
any of those sort of comedies where they improv a lot of stuff and take 10, 15 different takes. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of that happened here when they were making this and kept some of the more ridiculous takes for his character because he really was, and a lot of times I was kind of confused about like the electrical clamps on the nipples and the bomb going off and what all that meant and yeah. kind of stuff. Why were his nipples attached to It was that just a, a little confusing. <laughs> I mean, again, I don't have to understand all of it, but there, there's enough There's enough here where it's. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm nitpicking when I talk about those things. Yeah. They clearly affected you in a, on a ground floor level of your enjoyment of the movie. And that's fine, you know. Yeah, it is, it is what it is. I'll just say, like Fury Road, for like w mostly one long road trip action sequence, and it was like relentless. And we have a lot more interesting characters. Nicholas Holt's war boy character. You have Max, obviously, mm -hmm. Furiosa, and then you have the 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 brides or yeah, whatever they're brides, called, yeah. the wives. All that adds up to a very kind of compelling, and there's a lot of stakes there. Yeah, this one didn't feel like there was too many stakes, and it felt like this was like out of gas from the get-go mm. and then we finally when we finally hit the reserves and start really driving only to realize the journey is now over and we spent most of the most of the trip stalling and pushing the car <laughs> very 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 on the nose analogy yes thank you i love it david david wangberg is pissed but yeah it was um <laughs> I didn't. Uh, yeah, I'm actually. I feel like I'm actively liking it less and less. The, All right. Hey, the further, it was just so disappointing. I'm actively liking it less. And that's and why less. I think George Miller should unrelease this because for me, this is just for me. It's like it. It's like this. There's like it's like a stain. It's like ta tarnishing the Fury Road five out of five masterpiece action movie. Bullshit. Art. It's kind of like when like when Prometheus came out. Uh, the the whole the whole you I didn't mean, like Prometheus. I like Prometheus, but okay. what I'm saying is like the whole charm and like of of Alien is that we don't know where this alien came from. Right. That's yeah. like that's it's part the that's part of the mystery of the yeah. the horrorness of it. Um, I didn't need to know everything. Oh Jesus! I don't need to know everything about everything. <laughs> How dare you! No, and, here's the, and I, I feel for the, a movie like this, and I feel like I didn't I didn't give a fuck if I had a prequel or not. But what I got, I was like. There is, there's like a 59 Ranchero converted into a war boy mm. rig. There's a, it's, it's an old, like fi, late, eight, late, fif, late fifties, early sixties mm. Valiant. Mm. There's all kinds of very fun. I think they had at one point they have him having an Edsel converted. There's a, his war rig, his, a six wheeled three axled monster truck that's built out of a, like a Mack truck. <laughs> there's, uh, that's uh Dementis is. And it's the shit that they're doing in here. He just drives over stuff goes straight up the hill in this monster truck and you're like they're really doing that to some degree yeah you know not one for one but they're really doing all this stuff and you know hats off to 79 year old george miller for still making weird shit yeah. in the australian out outback into the desert <clears throat> yeah. yeah i i yeah it's i can't wait to watch it at home with volume at the proper level which is deafening yeah yeah i feel like i'll have to watch it again to on a smaller screen to i don't know maybe focus more on certain things but mm -hmm. yeah it didn't leave much of an impression on me coming out well the very the, the rare negative review that i haven't really seen a whole lot of which I, i'm always doing this because i'm sad yeah i know and i'm I, sad that it's not good i was excited when i saw your two and a half star <laughs> review for it on letterbox because i was like well this is at least going to be a fun conversation <laughs> yeah. and, and for the most part we align pretty well you and i on a lot of stuff but i don't know it's just yeah, I i'm it. like i don't want to not like it i wanted to like it yeah but it's got to be good. Yeah, the heart wants what the heart <laughs> wants. Joe Bridges says that expectations are the thief of joy. I thought that was comparison. <laughs> Expect. Oh my god, what a philosophical statement yeah. that he does. I'm pretty said. sure it's comparison is the thief of joy. It could be both. They both. The joy thieves. I guess all if, I, if I'm comparing Fury Road and Furiosa, then yeah, I guess that would still apply. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I will make my segment quick because we've had a nice long show. First off, before I get into actual streaming picks. Tyler, you called Nobody, the Bob Odenkirk movie, Mr. Nobody, a while back. Oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, I did. And yeah. I, I took you to task. I laughed in your face about it. Yeah. Turns out that's the name of the Japanese title when they released it, Mr. Nobody. <laughs> that's another movie, though. That's, that was uh, right. That's another real movie. That's a uh, Mr. Nobody is the uh, Jared Leto. Jared Leto movie, yeah. Uh. Alternate reality movie. But yeah, on Letterboxd, if you're a, like a pro Patreon, you can alter, you can change the poster when you log it. You can change it to multiple alternative posters oh, really? yeah they okay. have like 10 15 20 options or whatever for some titles mm -hmm. and one of my friends logged it and it said mr and it had some japanese writing in it and it was bob odenkirk's mm -hmm. face i'm like what movie is this and i clicked on it i'm like mr nobody in japan 
Tyler was right. So unknowingly, he fell ass backwards into correctness. Okay, so I did not watch a ton of stuff this week. I watched Social Media Monster, which we talked about already. Highly recommend when it comes out in a week. I watched Fern Gully for the show. I will talk about that later. We watched, I watched Stop Making Sense on HBO Max, which we just talked about as well. Mm-hmm. I watched Fury Road, which I guess it looks like I didn't even log it, but I need to. So the one that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is I've returned back to my Kung Fu, old school Kung Fu movies. Mm. Oh, okay. You and I... Back wa- of my bullshit. Yeah, you, my, <laughs> you and I watched it with the girls last week after the episode. Tyler took off and we were like, what are we going to watch? We'll put on a... Oh yeah, where are your parents now? Are they home? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think oh, first yeah. week in the month. They have yeah. <laughs> spent the weekend at yeah. home. <laughs> But uh, we watched Dirty Ho together. Dirty Ho. Dirty Ho is mm. the name of the movie. And uh, that was interesting. I didn't love it, but I think the the choreography of the, like the fight choreography was really good. It's from 1979, also a Shaw Brothers movie. And it's streaming on Arrow Video and a couple other places you can find. It's interesting because it's it's played for laughs a lot more. It's more feels more like evolving into the Jackie Chan era of Hong Kong cinema. Oh yeah. And this is also starring Wong Yu and Gordon Gordon Liu. I think I'll just shorten his name to Gordon Liu. That's he kind of how he goes in America. Mm-hmm. And this one is basically about one of the sons of an emperor, one of like fourteen sons of an emperor or something like that, mm-hmm. that doesn't want to take the emperor ship and his dad is going to pass it down and he's just kind of like enjoying art and drinking wine and all this stuff and there's assassins out to kill him so he's not the basically he doesn't get the throne even though he doesn't want it okay and throughout the entire thing he's trying to basically not let everybody know he's a kung fu master mm. so he's secretly fighting people and he's using he has like a like a, a servant woman yeah. and he tells every somebody at one scene that oh this is my bodyguard i hired her and he's, <laughs> he's, he's standing behind her like she's a human shield, but he's mm-hmm. using her arms and hands to fight this guy. Mm-hmm. And at one point there's a weapon involved and that's, she's like fl- manipulating the weapon, but he's like punching and kicking her backs of her arms to oh, make her I do see. things. And it's yeah. all that car- choreography was really good. Mm-hmm. But the movie itself was a little too goofy for me. Mm. Definitely so, a comedy. Yeah, it was for sure, for sure a comedy, which you don't. Not a good introductory if you're trying to get into martial arts movies. No. So after you guys left and then, so that's Dirty Ho. Dirty Ho. Yeah, H-O. Is a, Master Ho is a guy's name. And the, <laughs> after you left, I watched the, the next movie on that same disc from the Run Run Shaw produced mm-hmm. uh, movie. And it's called Heroes of the East, 1978. Mm. This is of the four so far that I've gone back and rewatched or watched for the first time. Heroes of the East is by far the most comprehensive in the fight choreography. It's more mm-hmm. it's more interesting in the story. Mm. It's more interesting the, of the characters. And this one is actually... It's a little bit of a history lesson on the difference between Chinese and Japanese weapons and fighting styles. So in this ver- in this movie, Gordon Liu again is the is the main character, and you know I watched some of his stuff from 1968, 1969. He was good back then. Now here we are, 1978, 1979 of these movies. Mm-hmm. He is leveled up big time. Wow, big time. So you know in the scene in, in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon where. It's Michelle Yeoh and Ji Yang Gigi that are fighting each other, and they're having the they're having the the multiple weapons fight. Yeah, there's like ten yeah. different weapons they cycle through during the course of the fight. Yeah, this movie does that spread out across the entire movie. Oh. So basically, Gordon Liu's character he is a also like a a son of some like ambassador, some kind of royalty sort of thing. Yeah. And he has an arranged marriage, but it's to a Japanese woman that he was friends with as a young kid. Mm-hmm. They get married. Turns out she's a Japanese martial arts expert and she's practicing in the backyard and everyone's, what are you doing? This, you know, Kung what Fu, is this? Chinese Kung Fu is way better than Japanese, you know, judo and yeah. karate and all this stuff and, you know, ninjutsu. And she basically brings in a bunch of her Japanese historical weapons into their training room mm-hmm. and hit the, the husband and the wife, who are both accomplished fighters, are arguing over which one's better, Japanese weapons or Chinese weapons. And it's this weird kind of history lesson that you don't have a definitive answer because she says that the the weapons, there's a similar comparison. There's like a, a stick with a knife on the end of it that's Chinese mm-hmm. and it's a stick with a knife on the end of it that's just Japanese. They call it a different name and they're used slightly different in the, in the context of this like fighting style. Mm. But he's giving her history lesson about it and we as the audience are listening along and getting the same lesson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you know in those kung fu movies where it has the long pole with a big knife on the end of it and it's right. like a red hanging yeah it has hair, like, hairy sort of thing right yeah it has the like flag or whatever yeah it's, it's like a hairy beard hanging yeah. on it. it's just swinging around well i didn't know really what that was 
but he calls it a, a blood screen. And he says that what you do is you spin it around like you see sometimes and you put it right in front of the, your victim's face, your opponent's face, and it shields their vision so that you, they can't see what the next uh, attack is happening. Okay. And at the same time, he uses, so he does it to her in battle after he teaches her. And he says, you can also uh, catch your opponent's weapon. So she's fighting him with the long stick and he wraps it up with that blood shield and makes it so she can't fight him anymore. Mm-hmm. And he pulls her closer to him and then was able to do, you know, some up close handwork with her. And you're like, oh, handwork. Yeah, yeah. You're like, damn, this is actually really interesting and informative. So the the long story of this story is that <clears throat> they have its lovers quarrel about it. They can't they can't come to any resolution. And she kind of runs back to Japan to see her dad and visit some friends and stuff. But basically, she's just you know, fuck my husband. This guy's an asshole. He's being mean about all this stuff. And he sends to try to get her to go back. He sends her a letter saying, "I challenge you to a fight." <laughs> and he says, I know that she can't resist it. So she's mm-hmm. going to come back. She's going to answer oh, the call man. and come back home. Instead of her getting the message, this like karate master that she's friends with, who's like the greatest martial artist in Japan gets the letter. Mm-hmm. And he says, how dare he fight his wife? How dare he fight this woman? <laughs> We're going to send six, seven of our like best fighting p- uh, champions of all these different martial arts styles to fight him. Oh my God. And that's basically what the rest of the movie is. After the first act is the setup and the last, last two acts is like him fighting seven different martial arts styles in seven days. Mm-hmm. They're like, we're only going to fight you one at a time because we have honor. One of them's a samurai. One of them's a ninja. Yeah. It's, you know, deceptive poison darts and shit that's being mm-hmm. thrown at him. <laughs> you know, dummies and, you know, costumes and smoke bombs and stuff. Sounds like a dynamite movie. It's really good. I mean, this is like as comprehensive as you can get when it comes to actual fight arts. So it's a four and a half star movie. It's available on Mubi and also Arrow Video. You can also rent it for three bucks on Amazon Prime or YouTube. Mubi. If you're looking to get it, if like if you heard kind of the conversation that I had last week and then this week about the, you know, these kung, old Kung Fu movies and you're like, well, I don't want to sit through some shitty movie. Watch Heroes of the East, 1978. All this, this, all this is in the show notes as, as usual, but just go on YouTube and rent it if you don't have Arrow Video Service, which very few people actually do. And if you're going to get into it, like I said, this is, it's a history lesson, but it is a absolute like 90 minutes of exhibition of impressive fight after impressive fight after impressive fight. Yeah. And it, it's, it really is a dynamite movie. So that's Heroes of the East 1978. Watch it if you want. Before we go, yeah. uh, take a break. Andrew said, he said, you just like this, Furiosa, and like Thunderdome. He's talking to me. Uh. <laughs> you need to revisit and have nostalgia crush. First of all, where did I ever say that? When I don't when think, any, I don't think anybody I, said you like the original. <laughs> <laughs> when did I ever say that? I have seen Thunderdome. I have not seen it since I was a child. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember enjoying it as a child. Yeah. But I have not seen it in, I don't know, how long? 15, 20 years? I think I watched number two last year and it was like, eh. They're kind of slow. Yeah. The original, the first two. Mm-hmm. But the yeah, the over cranked high frame rate sort of like fast motion is really distracting. Yeah, I uh, agree. It, that's how I felt about Furiosa. It's it's visible in Thunder or Thunder Road, Fury Road a little bit in a couple of key moments, but not distracting. In Furiosa, it's used quite a bit. Quite a bit. Very yeah. jolty. Yeah, jolty, and that's another thing that bothered me about it. And um, yeah. what's his name? Rectus, Rectus, and uh, Scrotus. Why the Scrotus. fuck would you introduce a character? <laughs> And then we don't see anything that happens to him because he's not in Fury Road. He's he's Beavis and Butthead. They're basically like Eric Trump and Donald Jr. <laughs> but why introduce him? He's not in the the next one. Because of the character of Rectus, the act, the actor just doesn't have the chops. Also, they introduce the fact that he's a pedophile and they never pay that off. Oh, no. and it's I don't know. There's there's a lot of weird ties and lingering. The guy's name is Scrotus. He looks like he looks like Beavis. He looked like butthead. he looked like Mikey Day as yeah. as Beavis. Yeah, or but or but yeah. I was like waiting for him to not be here anymore (laughs) uh okay anyways anything else fellas no no okay if you're on the youtube live please hang out for another like 15 minutes we're going to take a break empty our bowels interested in watching our view of fern gully yeah so we've already shit on joseph at least has furiosa yes and i've shit on the hollow the good name of halloween yes and And uh, me and uh, well yeah that's part of the course (laughs) how are we going to take this patreon pick which is Fern Gully from 1992. The inspiration for Avatar. Yeah, we'll, we <laughs> will talk about that in a little bit. So just stay tuned. We're going to go uh, take a 15 minute break and we'll be right back. <laughs> Real spoiler says Tyler is the only one we can trust now. <laughs> <laughs>
I love it. What world are we living in? It's a topsy turvy <laughs> world. It really is. So thank you to the cool ass yard duties on Patreon. That's Javier, Heather Sachs, Ryan Corbin, and Chris. If you want to join us on the Patreon, hit us up patreon.com slash middle class film class. Five bucks gets you on the wheel rotation. Until next time. Thank you to Peter John Ross, the director of social media monster for joining us. And thank you to all of you for listening. Follow us later on in the week or in a few minutes as we review Fern Gully, a Patreon pick from the Wheel of Destiny from listener McKenzie. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash MCFC podcast and send us an email MCFC podcast at gmail.com. And follow, sorry, and follow us. I was waiting. I, I don't five know. Why, years. I was, I, five I, I years. I don't know why I was waiting for Joseph to <laughs> lead us off on that. But uh, yeah, uh, please follow us on Instagram at Middle Class Film Class. And please leave us a voicemail at 209 730 6010. Follow us on Twitter at Podcast FDC and Telegram. <laughs> Bye. Very good. Bye. I gotta get out of here. The bell doesn't dismiss you. I dismiss you. You are free to go. See you next week. See you later. See you later. That's a wrap. Great show.